The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. Presently, by God's grace, we are undertaking a complete exegetical study of Paul's letter to the Romans. In our last episode, we examined Romans chapter 2 up into verse 11. In this episode, we continue our trek verse by verse through Paul's epistle to the Romans. Keep in mind, as stated, that Paul is now on his third missionary journey, riding from the city of Corinth to the church at Rome, where Paul has yet to visit. Let's give a bit of summary before we pick up in chapter 2 of verse 11. As you will recall, we gave an introductory episode to the book of Romans, and then we, enter, we opened up with chapter 1. And in chapter 1, as you will recall, by summary, what we saw there, especially beginning with verse 18, is God's revelation to Paul via the Holy Spirit and by extension to all God's people and the reality of what God sees from his positioning regarding mankind. There, in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. So what is Paul doing here? Paul is giving a logical discourse, step by step, revealing God's perspective on mankind from the standpoint of his perfect holiness, his righteousness, and his justice, looking at mankind. And when he looks at mankind, Paul therefore begins to give us a reasoned, logical, step-by-step approach to what God is seeing. And here in verse 18, he's basically saying that when God looks at mankind, apart from Christ, that mankind is in a state of ungodliness, of unrighteousness, and who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that is our nature. That's what we're born with. 
And as a result of that, all mankind from Adam and Eve at their fall until that point that uh, God is pleased to draw us to a, a sanctifying relationship with Christ, we are facing the wrath of God, which is justly to be poured out on us, okay? And because God's justice and his holiness is perfect, the wrath that follows against our ungodliness, which is basically untethered, is perfect. It is eternal. Uh, therefore, that is why hell is eternal. We further found out in chapter 1 that God provides to all mankind with what we might call a conscience, which gives him a basic understanding of the fact that there is a God, not necessarily a expositional uh, understanding in its totality of who God is, but just the basic fact that God exists and that it is apparent by what they see. And as a result of that conscience, uh, God has made manifest to them, not in the sense that they're going, it's going to lead to salvation, but rather that it's going to lead to condemnation, because what does man do? He violates his conscience in, at the end of the day, and repeatedly does what he knows to be wrong oftentimes. Ultimately, man's unregenerate heart compounds itself, as stated so often, like water, which seeks its lowest level and becomes festered with all sorts of spiritual disease, and man is ultimately cut off from God because of his nature. As the unregenerate man continues to deny his conscience and denies the visible revelation of God, of the existence of God, God progressively withdraws his presence and his, his sanctifying general grace from those, and man's heart becomes progressively dark, and he exchanges, as verse 23 says, the glory of the uncorruptible God and changes it into an image made like corruptible man, and to the creation, to birds, to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. This is the nature of what man does when he rejects God in his rebellion. Man then begins to, thereby in verse 25 and following, as God continues to withdraw, God gives them up to their natural, base, carnal affections, uh, all across the board, wherever it may be, in terms of everything that man looks at, rather than looking at the world around them and at ourselves in terms of glorifying God, we exchange that and we begin to glorify ourselves. We are seekers of pleasure rather than seekers of God. This ultimate leads to verse 29, verse 30, and verse 31 of chapter 1, where all of these various natural proclivities of man reach their ultimate debased level in all of the words that we looked at and their definitions. In chapter 2, we began to look at the idea that for those of us who are looking at chapter 1 and seeing this awfulness of sin and thinking that we ourselves are better because we have avoided uh, one, two, ten, or a hundred things on the other side of the fence that somehow, by virtue of avoiding one or a thousand things, that we're in a better position. God contradicts that by saying, well, for you, you're inexcusable when you judge or when you judge another. You condemn yourself because you've done the same things. What is he saying? Basically, he's leading up to chapter three of Romans where he's going to say that all have sinned. So, it doesn't matter what the sin is, the fact is that we've all sinned, and on that basis, we all uh, are worthy of death. Continuing, he tells us in verse 3 that we're not going to escape the judgment of God simply because we're judging others horizontally and believing that we're somehow slightly better than them in some way, shape, or form. Finally, we learn in our closing verse of last time, verse 11, that God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care whether you're black, white, Hispanic, or what race you are, what gender you are, or any of that. The issue is that we've all sinned, 
and that we have all fallen short of God, there is no excuse, and it doesn't matter that horizontally speaking, I'm better than Adolf Hitler, uh, I'm better than uh, Ted Bundy, I'm better than whoever else, because I haven't done as badly as them. The issue is, I've fallen short of God, who is the perfect standard, and on that basis, I have sinned. Period. End of story. Now, at this point, we continue with chapter 2, verse 12, where it says there, For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Now, first of all, let's talk about sin. In the Greek, hamartia, it means simply to miss the mark. It's an old English term adopted from the sport of archery, and in this case, the mark or the goal would be to achieve a bullseye, 100% of God's perfection in 100% of his attributes, 100% of the time, which is what God does. Anything less than 100% at any time would be to hamartia, to miss the mark, or to sin. So, here, Paul launches his legal argument as prosecutor for the guilt of all mankind as seen by God according to God's revelation. If you don't know or don't follow God's law, then you will perish without his law. The reason is that the law only serves to display how guilty mankind is. The law is like a ruler measuring 12 inches. And the reality is that mankind, all of mankind, is never more than 10 inches on the same ruler. If we apply the ruler, we have the confirmation that we have fallen short. But even if we hide the ruler, the reality is that we do not measure up. We may not know how bad the situation is, and one person has stated can compare they're standing at 8 inches and another at 3 inches and still another at 10. But regardless of these horizontal differences, the only measure that matters is that of God. And in that respect, we have every single human being on earth has fallen short. Now, well, what about those without the law? Well, here it says that they are judged according to God's general revelation. They are judged according to their own conscience, which we studied in chapter 1, which is given to all mankind by God. Is it slightly different from person to person? Yes. Does it vary based upon culture and uh, environment and uh, upbringing and uh, school and church and a thousand and one things? Yeah. But the point is, it's there to some degree. And whatever is there, God's going to you know, open it up as the ruler, and he's then going to compare each and every one of our actions according to that ruler that he's implanted in our um, minds and hearts, and he's going to go, look, your actions as seen from birth all the way up until that point that you died, don't measure up to the ruler that I gave you. You've fallen short. You've sinned. You've hammered it. You've missed the mark. So, those who know partially or completely the law are judged proportionally to their knowledge and compliance with the law, plus compliance and obedience to their own conscience, verse 12 and 13. Man's conscience either accuses or excuses him. If he does not repent, God judges according to the most secret thoughts and convictions of our heart, as according to verse 15 and 16. The point is that God will equally judge the living and the dead, and all who are without Christ will be judged guilty and will find their just reward of death and hell. Verse 13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. It is entirely insufficient to simply hear, to simply know, or to simply understand, even if one has 100% of all of these various things above. Only those who do the law 100%, 100% of the time, 100% correctly, are going to be justified by God. 
And in fact, as James chapter 2, verse 10 points out, quote, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Verse 14, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So here, Paul provokes his Jewish audience, whom he always has the greatest desire to reach. In this case, Paul uses the Gentiles, whom most, if not all Jews, would have seen as unclean. Secondly, the Jews thought themselves privileged and elite since God had given them the Mosaic Law. Contrary to this, Paul points out that by Jewish mindset, these pagan, uncircumcised people, the Gentiles, who do not even have the law, are on the same playing field and arguably better than the Jew who do by nature these things which are in spirit the law is trying to accomplish. Having said this, we know that neither the Jew nor the Gentile are doing the things contained in the law by their unregenerate nature. Because no matter who you are, our unregenerate nature is an enmity with God, and we are in rebellion against God, His Word, and His law. Were this not the case, Romans 3, which says there is none good, no, not one, we have all sinned, would be false. And since righteousness and pleasing God would be a possibility, then Christ's sacrifice would be unnecessary and pointless. But it is possible that Jew and or Gentile can be redeemed by Christ and receive a new nature. It is this new nature given by the indwelling Holy Spirit, which Christ working in and through us, which allows us to do by his nature the things contained in the law. Verse 15, which shew the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Paul echoes the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 33, regarding God's plan of reconciliation with his elect. Quote, Look, the days are coming, this is the Lord's declaration, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This one will not be like the covenant I have made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, even though I am their master. The Lord's declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my teaching within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people." Unquote. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 22 provides the explanation as to how this is accomplished. Here in Hebrews, it's clear that the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. 
First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them. Though they were offered in accordance with the law, then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have made, been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. The revelation of Hebrews continues regarding this subject in verse 14, which says, quote, For by one sacrifice he had, has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water." Unquote. So, Jeremiah, Hebrews, and others all point out the reality that only God is capable of exhibiting righteousness because that is his nature, his character, his attributes. Prior to Genesis 3, mankind was endowed with God's covering grace and image created at the beginning, and it was that image which God found very good in his estimation. But the moment that mankind took his eyes off God and placed his trust and faith in his own merits, knowledge, etc., we were disconnected from faith and we discarded God's covering grace. We could not return because the penalty was and is death. The only solution was for God himself to perform the righteousness, obedience, and virtue which is consistent with his own nature. Further, it was necessary to pay the price of death on behalf of all those whom he is pleased to choose and to freely pay the price so that we can be reconciled. Verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Verse 16 is the culmination of verses 12 through 16. The fact is that there is a day of judgment coming for all mankind throughout history for both the living and the dead, for the unregenerate and for the elect. At present, the reality of where we each are spiritually is to some degree a secret. Only God knows the truth of our hearts and whether we serve Christ or whether we serve ourselves. But on Judgment Day, all will be judged according to the universal measuring stick of Jesus. Further, there is no mystery involved because God provides God's clear revelation of Jesus and what his ruler looks like, so there is no ambiguity about the details, the method, and or the consequences. Everything we need to know is within the gospel. Whatever quote-unquote secrets that we hold, whether consciously or unconsciously, will be made manifest, and there is nowhere to hide. There are no excuses, and the outcome is eternal. Verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. In verse 17, Paul segues and begins a legal argument in order to illustrate the futility of righteousness according to man's works and merits versus righteousness freely given by God's grace according to Christ's finished work. Here, the hypothetical given by Paul 
is to assume that you are a Jew. In actuality, the hypothetical can include anyone of any race, gender, or nationality. But the example of a Jew is given because at this point, one, the Jews are who Paul is talking to, and two, the Jews are the ones who historically, at this point, are the ones who are trafficking in the law as a means of pleasing God. So, assume you are a Jew and that you are placing all your hopes, expectations, and efforts into pursuing pleasing God by fulfilling and following the law. Further, by virtue of your attempts to do so, you ultimately can go around telling yourself and others that you have in fact pleased God and that God is satisfied with the results, or at least with your sincere efforts. Verse 18, And knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. So here the hypothetical continues. Assume further from verse 17 that as a Jew you know God's purpose, his wishes, and his desires. You are an expert who skillfully and honestly studies, weighs, and can positively identify and distinguish between good and bad, lawful and unlawful, and anything being correct versus incorrect. You have received and understood all of what you know from God's law. Keep in mind that when we're talking about the quote-unquote law and being a Jew, we're not limiting ourselves to the Ten Commandments. We are ultimately talking about all 613 laws, ordinances, statutes, commandments, rules, and regulations which became part of the law. More importantly, here, by virtue of personal experience, Paul points out that the average Pharisaical Jew assumes that they, quote-unquote, know God's will and approve or gravitate towards the, quote, more excellent, unquote, things because they are instructed out of the law. In other words, knowledge and instruction of the Mosaic law became the basis and the bias by which those who pursue it assume that because they pursue it, that they are closer to God or impressing God by their piety. It is a vicious cycle of misguided circular reasoning. Verse 19, And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. So again, the hypothetical from beginning at verse 17 and continuing with 18, here continues in verse 19, saying that the, this misguided circular reasoning of self-righteousness creates arrogance and false confidence, wherein not only do you think that you are righteous and can please God based upon your own wisdom and piety, but you also believe that you are now in a position to teach and guide others to the same level of self-righteousness. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes clearly thought that they belonged in the class of the confident, the guides and the light, and they had forgotten humility and mercy. While we can be angry, judgmental, or disappointed with them, other than their mindset, we should not forget that we all run the risk of our own self-righteousness and arrogance. What we know, if we know it, and where we are, if we are there, it is all a result of God's grace. Moreover, God resists the proud, and he lifts up the humble. Verse 20, An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. So here again in verse 20, the hypothetical continues, compounding from verse 17. Verse 20 continues to show this effect of self-righteousness and bias which comes from legalism and pride. Here, the circular reasoning of self-pride now includes the idea that everyone who has not achieved your station in life is a fool. They are a babe, a child in need of basic education. But the reality is that the knowledge and truth which the self-righteous believe has led to them being a success, 
God's approval, righteousness, and holiness is in fact hollow and only a shell without any substance. The reason is that the law is meant to be a ruler and, or as Paul reveals, a schoolmaster. Both display the fact that we don't and cannot measure up. We fall short of the full measure that God demands. This concludes this uh, episode. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. The world falls